So I hope nobody here listening to this has any hatred in their heart, but I'm sure everybody's experienced moments of hate. And really, when you think about it, it seems like a very uh, irrational emotion to hate. Where does it come from? Is anybody born a hateful person? Is it based on conditioning? Is it innate or acquired? And does there any value to the word hate? Is there any good hate, so to speak? Or is all hatred bad? So when we react to hatred, we all think of it as a negative thing. And yet, how do you distinguish, for example, between hatred and between, uh, let's say, loathing or uh, being disgusted by, by a, a despicable behavior? You know, there's certain things that disturb us. So what is, how do you distinguish between one form of dislike and another form of dislike? So though this word is used so often, I think when you really dissect it, the anatomy of hatred is far more complicated than it may seem. And of course, it goes back to the question, as I said, where does hatred come from? Why should one person hate another? Why should people hate altogether? And, uh, and f unfortunately, uh, being that I uh, deal with many people and counsel people and so on, very often you find, even though it's one of the, one of the hardest things to acknowledge, many people do carry in their hearts a lot of negative feelings to individuals. Some people are angry at their parents. Some people are angry at their schools and uh, educators. Some people are just angry at society. Some people are angry at everyone. You know, I'm sure you've met people in life that you go, any, any given thing that ticks them off and they suddenly uh, get angry. You go to the airport, road rage, all kinds of irrational type of uh, behaviors that are clearly not based on uh, rational thought, that people just have this type of negative feelings. Obviously, hatred is a stronger one than just saying uh, rage and anger, but it's still there. Many people have hatred in their hearts. And, um, and uh, psychologists, thinkers, philosophers have long discussed and tried to understand this uh, attribute called hate. So I want to give a Torah perspective on it, especially considering, as I said, we're coming from Sinai 3,327 years ago. Uh, the Torah was given at Sinai, and we celebrate that to commemorate it every year. So this has been the 3,327th 3, anniversary. And the word Sinai, which is so often used, comes, as the, as the Medrash says, sheyardo sina la'evdi kachavim mazalas. That when Sinai, when Sinai happened, besides all the great things happened, a hatred descended on earth to everything that is antithetical to God, to idolatry. But the word hatred is used, sina. Sinai from the word sina. As I said before, even though it's with a samach and a sin, but it's used in the context of the word hatred. Now, of course, when you start analyzing hate, you always think in terms of it's one of the ways to analyze a word and a, and, a, and a feeling or emotion. You always think in terms of the word love. So is love, love and hate opposites? Is hate the absence of love? Is love the absence of hate? Are they indeed two opposites? Can you love and hate something? Or does love really mean that you love something so you hate everything that deprives you of that love? So love is another word that is very important to bring into the equation when you discuss this topic. And I think it's relevant to all of us, even people who have a pleasant disposition and a uh, nice attitude and don't really express hatred and so on. But we all have times in life where something happens where we get very uh, disturbed, where we uh, feel it's unfair, Sometimes it spills over into vengeance and uh, jealousy, envy. So hatred really borders on many different negative emotions. Now, people who are consumed with hate, one of the worst parts of it is that it really eats away at you like a cancer. Because when you have that uh, type of negative attitude to something that happened in your life, you almost cannot escape from it. You know, one good example, or not good example, one example in our times is children of Holocaust survivors. So it's, it's known to be a real syndrome. When you grow up in a home of Holocaust survivors, you often have a lot of toxic energy because Holocaust survivors went through hell. Many of them have a lot, a lot of anger inside of them. Many of them have guilt inside of them and many other type of reactions that when children are exposed to, it has an impact. So you never find a child that's born a hateful child. I would submit that every child is born with a measure of joy, um, and what happens later in life is what we pick up, or early in life even, what we pick up from our families and parents and so on. But the question is, who was the first hater in history? 
Where did hatred come from? If it's a conditioning, if it's a, an acquired a type of emotion, it had to originate somewhere. So taking all this into account, so I would like to discuss the theme, um, is there hatred in your heart? And what can we do about it? When I say hatred, is again, I mean all types of negative feelings. Something, let's say, happens to you that you were not expecting a disappointment. How do you react? Some people react very aggressively, you know, really angry, and they build up a real resentment to those that hurt them or deprive them. Others actually go the other way around. They retreat. Many people are afraid of confrontation, pleasers, and so on. So they basically swallow it. Is that healthier? Not to have a reaction. So when any negative thing happens to us, all kinds of forces begin to emerge. And the truth is, if you really want to understand yourself and a personality that your type is, you have to see yourself not in regular situations. In a regular situation, most of us have a certain stability and resilience that, uh, that manages. But when things happen that are extreme, God forbid, something negative, trauma, or something you didn't expect and you didn't plan for, that's when you start seeing our true personalities emerge. You know, challenges, for example, bring out the best in some people and, some, and the worst in others. Uh, the love brings out the best and the worst. When we're vulnerable and we're not in control, total control of our situation, that's when you really see what a person is made of. You know, I mean, not, no one should be tested, but life is such that curveballs will come our way. There'll be disappointments, there'll be relationships, there'll be dreams shattered, there'll be relationships, even betrayals, abandonment. You know, sometimes you feel like you're, um, many people today suffer, and they try to avoid being hurt because they were in love with someone or they felt they were in love with someone and then they were, um, they were rejected. And then nobody likes to be rejected. So we put up more, we build walls and defense mechanisms and we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable again. So we have all kinds of me mechanisms and methods that we use when we deal with challenging situations. So in, in the broader sense, the word hatred is not just about hating, it's also about how do you deal with a negative and adversarial situation. Do you, have the, the, do you have the power to be, able to, um, to be able to absorb the pain and move on and grow? Or does it overcome and overwhelm you? You'll see some people go through difficult experiences. They become very bitter, very angry, and very hateful. Yes, hateful. To the point you come, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a party or to an event where a stupid little thing ticks somebody off and they suddenly start scowling. And you realize that the person has a lot of hatred inside of them, a lot of anger inside of them. And it's, it's, not always, it's not always predictable. You can have people who are very pleasant on the outside and everything seems to be fine. Then one little thing, and they go ballistic. So it really, it's, it's really looking at ourselves with a microscope, which is always, not always comfortable to do. But this is, in essence, what Judaism and Torah is all about. And I always say this as an introduction that, um, because I think this is a vital component. So many people today, so many Jews today, have rendered Judaism into being something that maybe at best is ritual and some type of tradition that we keep, but doesn't necessarily have that type of psychological, emotional, and spiritual relevance that really would make something indispensable to us. And the best proof is this. See how many traditional Jews, observant Jews, Orthodox Jews, or whatever you call them, I, I don't like labels, as you know, but whatever label you use, um, labels are good for, for clothing, not for people. It's hard to label a soul. but. You'll see how many people who are so-called traditional, observant, whatever level, how many people turn to the Torah to get their personal advice. You know, the Torah at best is about our history, tells us about our holidays, it tells us about what mitzvahs to do, obligations, a lot of beautiful things in the Torah, ethical principles, moral principles. But very few people, if at all, you'll find they'll say the Torah is the best place to go get an x-ray of your soul. If you really want to understand what your soul is like, you should open up the Torah. I would challenge anyone to know how many people would say that makes that statement I just made. Because though the truth is that the Torah is that, most people have no clue. So the Torah at best, as I said, is a document, a divine document, given at Sinai, where God shares, gave, gave us his mandate of how to live our lives. And with a, a lot of beautiful principles. Look, at the end of the day, the Bible remains the biggest best-selling book in history. The New York Times, all the bestsellers in the New York Times do not compete with the amount of Bibles that are sold in a year. Millions of Bibles are sold every year. And this, this has been going on for hundreds of years. And um, so it remains the most popular book out there. And of course, not just for Jews. Uh, there's two and a half billion Christians and 1.75, 1.1 and a half billion Muslims and counting. 
and they all see the Bible as their first holy book, in addition to other books that they have. So the Bible still remains, and basically, uh, I don't know if I want to use the word haunts a society, but it still dominates so much of people's uh, consciousness. But, uh, but nevertheless, most people reading the Bible see it as a book that talks about events that happened many, many thousands of years ago, that has many messages, but you go to a therapist when you want to have, understand your soul. And even therapists, most of them don't do a good job. So one of the premises of this class, and when I began giving it back in 19, long time ago, before some of you were born, 1982 is when this class began, in an unbroken chain every Wednesday night. Well, then it was Thursday night, then it moved to Wednesday night. And the, the premise, you know, there are many Torah classes, and everyone has to have their mission. So I see the mission of this objective of this class, particular class. Though I don't like the word class either, but whatever word you use for it, is more of a, the spiritual and psychological emotional relevance of Torah concepts. Basically, the universal wisdom of Judaism. You know, there are many classes that can, you can go to and read the commentaries on the Bible. You can read Halacha Jewish Law. There's Jewish History. There's Talmud. There's uh, many, many parts of Torah, so many different areas of Torah that can be studied. Tanakh, and so on. Ethics. But there's, I find that the most single most important uh, element that is necessary today is relevance. Relevance, relevance, relevance. To demonstrate how ideas in the Torah are not archaic, they're not just historical value. They're not just about our history and our nation, but they have profound uh, insight into the human condition. And when you read it properly and you know how to decipher the Torah, it teaches you tremendous lessons in, our, in what our, our psyche is about. Because the Torah, above all, is a blueprint for existence. Just like a doctor would take an x-ray of your body, the Torah is an x-ray of our soul. Or to put it in other terms, God created life and then gave us an operator's manual for life. So the engineer of the machine called life gave us an operator's manual how this life works. What makes us tick? Because we didn't create ourselves. Both our bodies and our spirits and our emotions and our minds and our unconscious and everything about us was not self-made. Someone crafted it and crafted it with design. And the Torah reveals for us that design and its purpose. So if you really want to get a snapshot or you want a CAT scan of God's mind or a picture of yourself, what you really are like beneath the surface, not what you think you're like, not what others have told you, but really what is your soul, what, is it, what, what, what parts make up your soul, your being, yourself, your psyche, that's what the Torah truly is. Now that's something that many people have never learned, they've never even heard this in yeshiva. I know people who are Torah scholars and don't, have never heard the statement I just made. Even though if you look in the Torah, the Torah talks about it, it says so. It says that just like an architect creates a building, the Torah is a ar- blueprint that God used to create the universe. Istakel bar the Zohar says, God looked into the Torah, and with that he created the world. That's why you have in the beginning of Genesis, where it says, Vayemer Elikim, God said, Yehi Eir, Vayehi Eir, and there was light. Now the Torah is very precise and very brief. Why, why, what's the redundancy? What does it mean, Vayemer Elikim, God said, Yehi Eir, there should be light, and there was light. He could have just said, Vayivra Elikim Ar. Three words. And the Torah has no problem. The Torah is, is brilliant at brevity and, sh- and, and short sa- st- sentences. Three words instead of having all these words. So the answer given is very simple. That God, like a good architect, he first p- prepared a blueprint and then he read the blueprint and followed the blueprint. Vayivra Elikim. He looked into the blueprint that says, Yehi Ar. There should be light. So then, Vayivra Ar. Based on that, as a contractor, he built what the blueprint stated. Now obviously, God is not a human being, but he wanted to give us a model by which we can follow so we can relate to God. So that's how God manifests in Dibra Teru Beloshim Bnei Adam. The Torah speaks in the language of a human being in order for us to have a relationship. So it's really about a relationship between the divine and the human being. That's why you have the stories of wrestling with the angel, wrestling with God, and so on. So the Torah, without going into more elaboration, because this is more of an introduction, I want to get back to the topic, Torah essentially is a blueprint of existence, including ourselves. The beginning of the Torah, it says God created the human being in the divine image. What does that mean? We were creating the divine image. What does that mean? It means that if you want to understand what makes you tick and who you are, you need to study the divine. Or through yourself, mipsari from my flesh I behold God. So when you study human anatomy 
and you study human biology, and you study medicine, and you study astronomy, the macrocosm of the universe, all these are the footprints and the fingerprints of God. They help understand and teach you what God is like, because he implanted himself like a good architect in existence, and the Torah is the blueprint that helps us do that. So if the universe is the machine, or the computer, or whatever you want to call it, the Torah is its operator's manual. And it tells you what makes this world work better and what makes life work not, not better. For example, in a computer, you bring home a new machine. So it tells you, warning, do not uh, pour water on it. Make sure it doesn't fall. All the different things. Keep it in a certain uh, uh, temperature. Not too hot, not too cold. Because if you do any of the above, you cause damage to the machine. So the Torah, too, has do's and don'ts. Mitzvah says are positive mitzvahs and negative ones. It says when you do this mitzvah, it makes you a healthier human being. When you don't do it, or you do something that is antithetical, it, it breaks your system. No different than, for example, uh, someone giving you a, a uh, booklet that tells you these foods will make you stronger, or these nutrients will nourish you and make you a healthier human being, and these foods are poisonous or toxic. So the Torah's laws of do's and don'ts are not some type of like, so, you know, thought a random, thought, uh, unth- uh, God forbid, um, uh, arbitrary rules. They are the rules of existence. Even the concept of reward and punishment that people so attribute to the Bible, God punishing. Why would God punish? God is a creator. We are the creatures. It doesn't make any sense that a creator would want to punish its creatures. I mean, what God is like some, some, type of, uh, some type of equal with us. Like, you know, two people, one person. You did this to me, tit for tat, I'll do this to you. Mid the connected mid. And the, the Shalah, a great 16th century scholar, writes and cites many of the Kabbalists and other thinkers that Scharva Einish in Hebrew, reward and punishment, are actually cause and effect. Cause and effect. Very different than reward and punishment. What that means is that when you put your hand in fire, for example, would anyone say the fire is punishing your hand? No. You'd say it's the cause and effect of nature. That fire and the hand shouldn't be touching each other. When, when you do the right thing with your hand, you exercise it, you feed it properly, then you are making it stronger. So that's what the mitzvahs are. They actually mean a mitzvah does not mean a commandment. The word mitzvah comes from the word tzavse v'chibra. It means a connection. A commandment and connection are very different words. Most people don't want to be commanded. But connected, everybody wants to be connected. We have mobile phones. We want to network. Introductions. I want to be connected to this one, to that one. I want to be connected with myself. I want to be connected with the people I love. So connections are very far, far different than commandment sounds like imposed. Someone's telling you this, you must do this, can't do that. But if you can understand how mitzvahs are connections, and the word avera actually means a disconnection. What does the word avera mean? What we usually translate as sin. It comes from the word havara, mirishus, lirishus. Avar, displacement. When something moves in the wrong place, something like a displaced joint, a displaced hip, a displaced elbow, a displaced uh, soul is, has moved away from its natural habitat. Like what we call golos, exile is displacement. You don't feel at home somewhere. You don't feel comfortable. So a mitzvah is a connector and an aver is a disconnector. So just take a simple example. When we give charity, stuck. So everybody knows this mitzvah. It's a mitzvah that has become universal today. Once upon a time it wasn't universal. But the mlas is daka mishpat, that Abraham initiated as a pioneer, that human beings should be charitable. That, that, that if you're blessed with something, you should give to others. Whether it's financially, or time, or energy, or wisdom, or whatever it may be. You know, today makes sense, everyone's embraced this concept. But it was not, throughout history, a universal concept. Jews embraced it, the children of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. At the Torah, at Sinai, 3,327 years ago, it became a formal mitzvah, a formal and then slowly throughout history, Stucker became a noble, a noble um, uh, act. But if you look throughout history, when monarchs ruled 500 years ago, they weren't charitable. Some of them happened to be in a good mood, so they were charitable. But they weren't, it wasn't a universal principle. We were all at the mercy of whoever was in control. And if he was not charitable or she was not charitable, we suffered. Today, charity is like a foundation of, of a Western culture, and Eastern culture for that matter too. In the United States, we reward charity, tax-deductible donations. We reward it. We see when there's a disaster, God forbid, in some country, 
everybody today comes to participate in humanitarian aid. Why? Why, why say, why should we spend our hard-earned tax dollars to help, uh, to help uh, um, uh, uh, poor creatures in Haiti? What do we have from them? Yet, because it's become a universal principle that giving is the right thing to do. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, the two wealthiest people in the world, are challenging now all the billionaires with a giving pledge. I don't know if you've heard of it. Go to givingpledge.org. That all billionaires in their lifetime should give away 90% of their wealth. And so goes antithetical to the selfish model. You know, I earned it, it's mine, why would I give it away? I'll give away a little. But 90%? It's a lot of money. Mind you, 10% of those billions is also a lot of money. But still, greed is greed, and that's it. The more you have, the more you want. Is it can go to giving pledge. You'll see, you'll see how many Jews they, they basically shamed into giving because it doesn't pass. If everybody else is doing it, how could I not? The point I want to make is that charity has become part of the culture, the fabric of our society. <clears throat> now let's analyze charity. So most people think of charity as the right thing to do. If God blessed you a certain amount of money, and there's a person who is homeless, God forbid, or impoverished, has many children, can't feed them, and so on. It seems the right thing to do is to share some of your money. Tithe, meiser, chemish, 10%, 20%, whatever it may be. To share of your blessings. That's the usual understanding of charity. Now, some people do it and some people don't. But everyone can understand the logic. But comes it's much deeper than that. Based on what I said before, that a mitzvah nourishes you, when you give to somebody, you're not just helping them, you're helping yourself. You're massaging, you're exercising the feature, the virtue called chesed in your soul. So just like a body has muscles and has limbs and organs and it has nerves and has blood, blood vessels, arteries and veins and, and capillaries and so on, and it needs to be nourished. It needs to be nourished through food, through oxygen, through drink, through exercise, different nutrients, different vitamins. The soul too is made up of parts. And one part is called chesed. Chesed is a part of our soul. Chesed means to give, to love, loving kindness. When a person does not give, they are not just not doing the right thing for another person, you're not exercising, your chesed is not being nourished. It's nourished by your giving. That's why it says, more than what the giver gives to the taker, to the receiver, the receiver gives back to the giver. Like the idea of, in, like the day that the Talmud says that the teacher asked, where did you learn so much? He said, I learned much from my teachers. I learned even more from my colleagues. And from my students, Yesu Mekulam. I learned most. So when you give to someone, essentially it gives back to you more than you even gave. You may have given financial aid or food or some other, or your time or volunteered for something. But what it gave back to you is it fed and nourished your chesed. It makes you a healthier person. Giving people are healthier than taking people. Giving is healthier. So a mitzvah is not just obligations and commandments. It also makes you a healthier person. And an avera, the antithesis, person who doesn't give, doesn't breathe. What is give and take? It's breathing. Imagine you only inhaled and never exhaled. You only took, took, took. Elam tikach. I'm always taking hav, hav. Give me more, more, more. You know the joke they tell about the guy that was drowning in the, in the, in the, in the sea? And... Um, so they, they rode up with a boat near him, and they, say, they said, give me your hand, give me your hand. And he refused, give me your hand. So one of his friends who was in the boat says, tell him, take my hand. He doesn't know how to give. He knows how to take. Take my hand, and then he gave his hand. So he said, give me your hand. No, he didn't want to give, but take my hand. Some people just don't know how to, how to give. Sometimes it's due to our own narcissism. It can be due to insecurity. People who actually feel very confident with themselves have no problem sharing. Think of the example of like a flame. A flame has no problem lighting another flame because you don't get diminished. So there are people who are, are, are more natural givers. When a person doesn't give, what happens is you like cut off the air path of give and take, which is part of the breathing mechanism of the world. Imagine a person never loved anybody. They only allow themselves to be loved, which means I'll take everything you want to give me, but I give nothing in return. Which of course is midas doim, essentially. That uh, you, you, know, you, give, you take, but you don't give. Uh, the, midas, uh, the different uh, opinions exactly what that midas is. But the bottom line is, part of life is breathing. Imagine your organs, 
decided, you know what, your blood, your, your heart said, I'm not interested in sending blood to my brain. And the brain said, I'm not interested in sending messages to my heart. What would you have, God forbid? So life is all about symbiosis and harmony where everything is in a give and take process. So when a person decides to become cut off and I will only take care of myself, it's not just they're just upsetting the social order. They're upsetting their own healthy mechanisms. Love is not just what you do for another person. When you love, you become a far better person. The loving person becomes a far better person. So when you take this in context, and I'm going to bring it back now to the concept of love and hatred, of course, is that the Torah is essentially a blueprint for life, and the mitzvahs are ways to connect to yourself, and are various other ways to disconnect. And every one of the, 600, the 613 mitzvahs, the 248 positive ones, are, correspond to the 248 limbs in the body, and 365 negative ones correspond to the 365 sinews, nerves, different ways it's interpreted, or glands in the body. There's a book called Sefer Charedim, where he documents and says which mitzvah corresponds to which limb and to which nerve. So essentially, when you, for example, let's take the mitzvah I just said, Zdokah, Zdokah is connected to the heart. The heart as the heart is in emotions, the seed of emotions. When you give charity, that nourishes your heart, both physically and spiritually, and psychologically. So there are mitzvahs that are connected to the mind, for example, studying Torah. There are mitzvahs that, that are connected to speech, uh, prayer, uh, even learning Torah sometimes, expressing in words, gratitude, saying thank you. All, every mitzvah has a feature that, car- that helps make that corresponding limb or organ or part of your body and soul healthier. Now, if you look at mitzvahs that way, it's a whole different take. It's not just, okay, what commandments does God want me to do? You know, shavuos, we eat blintzes. It's not exactly a commandment. It's a custom, but it became a, almost like a command. You know, just like uh, Hanukkah is latkes. These are all, um, actually, and, uh, these are all, uh, what do we call them, uh, uh, secondary benefits of the holidays. It's not the real core of the holiday. But regardless, food is always a central component in Jewish history, in Jewish life. But the point is that every holiday, every mitzvah, is more than just commemorating events that happened that mitzvah makes you a healthier person. Let's take Shabbos, for example. And many people have already acknowledged this. Some people I know that never kept Shabbos in their entire lives, then they discovered Shabbos, and they said they, can't, they couldn't be a happier human being. Imagine, once a week, no matter what happens, it's not up to you, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a rule, you have to shut down. You have to shut down your machines, you have to shut down your texting, you have to shut down the whole rush hour of your life, and you're able to just celebrate as a human being who I am, the soul that's within you. It's an extremely healthy thing to do. You see, almost in every system, they tell you, take time out. Even in the middle of the workday, go to the park, spend an hour, mindfulness, meditation. I mean, all that is like mini Shabbos, essentially. It's about shutting off, unplugging from the, all the machinery and all the noises that, are just, that distract us, that seduce us, that uh, overwhelm, inundate us. And just be yourself. And be with the people you love. Talk to them, tell a story, share time. It's a very precious commodity today. Most people don't have time. I'm busy working, working, working. A machine that never stops ultimately burns out. So even on a very basic level, obviously Shabbos and all other mitzvahs have many other dimensions. And it's not just this. But I'm pointing out is that a mitzvah is not just a commandment, do this and don't do that. It's actually the healthiest way you can be. What has to be, what, what an important thing has to be done is, and I guess this is one of the challenges of our day and our time, is to teach people how. How this mitzvah that you put on, let's say tefillin every day, or Shabbos, or kosher, and so on, how does that nourish my soul? How does that nourish my psyche? So now let's go back, being that the, after establishing this premise, this axiom, that the Torah is here to teach us about ourselves, and of course our purpose in life, and our relationship with God because it's the engineer's manual, it's the operator's manual of who you are. Imagine a book that gives you a mirror image of your soul, of your psyche. So what does the Torah say about hatred and about love? Well, interestingly, hatred and love is exactly what I described as mitzvah and aver. I don't like the word commandment and sin, so I'm going to use the word connection and disconnection. What essentially is love? If you cut through beyond the word, it's the connection of two, of two things. You and the thing you love. It could be an object, it could be a food, it could be... But let's talk human love. 
Human love is the connection between two people who care about each other, who will go out of their way to help the other, who feel an emotional connection, attachment, uh, however you know, the words you use, to another. It means it's transcending yourself and connecting to another. What is hate? The exact opposite. It's disconnecting. It's being repelled by something. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this person. So one is a connector, one is a disconnector. In many ways, sina and ave, in the Hebrew words, have that meaning. So it's far more than just, oh, I hate something, I don't hate it. It's a disconnecting element. If you, for example, develop the hatred to your own siblings, and people that have siblings, unfortunately, I know they don't talk to each other. You know, whether you call it hatred, they call it whatever you want to call it, jealousy. And they have all kinds of good reasons. I was in business with them, and then they ripped me off. You know, they used to always uh, lie, to, lie to my parents about me. You know, people have sibling rivalry. Well, sibling rivalry is a, is a normal thing. But then there's siblings that actually do not talk to each other. There are people who, who are friends their entire lives, and then they decide no longer. So it's a disconnect. So if you think of it that way, you can start understanding why these emotions are, da- are damaging. You know, we all don't like hatred. We don't like the word. But what it really comes down to is the, toxic, the toxicity is that how you pronounce it? Toxicity. The toxic nature of, um, of hatred, what is it? Is, is it contaminate? It's a contaminant. You know, we have a doctor in the house here, right? So you know that in healing, I mean, if you could, if you could sum up medicine, not in medicine, health. If you could sum up health, health is, everything is connected. A newborn, healthy child is born. Everything flows seamlessly. Right? The, you see a, a child's uh, lungs you can actually see the lungs heaving up and down. You don't see that in adults, because many of our lungs already have been somewhat toxified, so we don't even use for our complete lungs. Our arteries get hardened. Our muscles wear down. The rest of our body goes through wear and tear. What, what, what happens when the machine starts wearing and tearing? The flow is diminished. The, the circulation, the nervous system, the neurological systems, all the systems that go through the entire uh, body and all elements of it. So essentially, when you say mitzvah, you say ava, you're really saying a connector. Everything is connected, everything is flowing seamlessly. And we all know that really the miracle of the human body is such that it's so complex. Trillions of cells in our body. So many different systems, and they all, when they work well together, it's literally like a miracle. Any good doctor will tell you, they don't create health. The natural body is a healing agent, has its own immunity, but sometimes you need assistance either due to infection or due to disease or due to an accident or whatever it may be, or age, you need to help the healing agents of the body to heal themselves. So you have to get rid of the infection, you have to do it. But the body itself is a natural cleanser. It cleanses itself in its, when it's healthy. It goes through all the processes. It eliminates waste. It preserves and retains the nutrients and so on. So all that is part of a... Um, of a, of a, that's what's called love. Now, I know you're not going to say that the, body, the organs in the body love each other because we don't think in terms of human emotions that way, but it means they all work with each other. And hatred is the, is the, is the, is the manifestation of separation, of dislocation, where everyone is doing their own thing and there's no communication to the point there's even distrust, to the point of actual hatred, point of really despising one another. You know, different uh, thinkers say that, and that's where you have many, many groups that today, for example, whether it's blacks and whites, or blacks and Jews, or even Middle East, Arabs and Jews, that where there's a lot of dis- differences and a lot of stereotypes and hatred between different communities, they say, education, let people join together, study about each other, sit at the same table, and you suddenly discover we have a lot more in common than you may think. What essentially you're saying is that hatred is a part of disconnection, and bringing people together. Sometimes you hate something, you don't even know why you hate it. Think of anti-Semitism. Maybe it's the ultra-hatred of, of, of history. What is behind anti-Semitism? Yeah, you can say there's some Jews you don't like, but there's also some non-Jews that are not really likable. You know, people case by case. Why would there be a complete blanket hatred to Jews? So many books have been written and analyzing this for all the different reasons and all the excuses. But the bottom line is, it's a disconnect and very often based on ignorance and based on culture, where it just becomes something part of the culture. 
that, you know, they use words like you Jewed someone, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not talking about anti-Semitism particularly in this class, but I was just bringing it as an example. So if you cut it down, if, you, if, you're able to, if you're able to eliminate the, strip the words hatred and love from their word itself, you're really talking about connect and disconnect. So when you talk about hatred, you're really talking about a person who's disconnected, not just from others, also from themselves. Do you think a person who hates only hates other people? They hate themselves. They may not say it, but uh, they ultimately are disconnected. They don't know how to connect to a part of themselves. And that's why they feel someone else has taken something from me. So all disconnections start from within. And the same thing with love. If you don't know how to love yourself, really, you can't really love another person. You'll say, one second, there are a lot of people who don't like themselves, but they love others. Well, often that's unhealthy love. It's a love that's more out of desperation, that you're desperate for another person simply because you're dependent on someone giving you something you don't feel you have. But healthy love is always connected to a measure of self-respect. When you have self-respect, it usually spills over into respecting another person. I'd say usually, I would say always. And when you don't have self-respect, it usually is going to spill over into lack of respect to others. You cannot respect someone else if you don't respect yourself. So essentially, when you really think of it this way, you're thinking of terms of connection, you're thinking of disconnection. And that's really what it comes down to. And that will help also, if you think of it in that context, help understand um, what, what, what this, uh, what this uh, emotion, this, uh, this feeling of hatred is about, where it comes from, and what you can do about it. If someone says, listen, I just have hatred in my heart, what am I supposed to do? But if you say it's disconnection, yeah, the way you deal with it is to start connecting. Find ways to connect. Just like in the human body, if God forbid uh, there's, a, a, there's a block, a blockage that doesn't allow, that impedes the flow of the blood to a certain part of the extremities of the body, or the nerve is pinched, what do you do? You have to find a way to open up the channel. You have to find a way to connect. When there's disconnect, the way to do it is to connect. Now the interesting thing about health as I've mentioned many times, is health doesn't feel like anything. If someone asked you, what does health feel like? If you were able to answer that question, you probably need a doctor. Because you know, what health feels like what? It shouldn't feel like anything. Someone says to you, what does breathing feel like? It shouldn't feel it. Just a seamless flow of air inside into your lungs and, and exhaling, inhaling, and that's that. Your blood flowing through your veins shouldn't feel like anything. If you feel something, that means there's something wrong. So health is an invisible, it's like an, an invisible sensation of just anyone that's healthy knows I'm just, I just feel like I'm alive. If you start feeling a description, a thud, I'm sorry, a dull sensation, a sharp dead sensation, a painful sensation, that's a sign of something wrong. So it's when there's disconnect, that's where you feel, that's where noise happens. You know, when people are healthy, it seems almost seamless. It seems like it's invisible because everything is just working well. But we live in a world of a lot of discord. And uh, so well, let's discuss now what's the root of this connection. So here's how the Kabbalists put it. And I'll quote the Arizal, the, the classic Arizal, the greatest mystic of them all, who lived in the 15th, 16th century, lived a few, just a year and, and, and eight months in Sfat before he passed away at a young age, 37, 38. And the Arizal, in a sense, I can't say revolutionized, because in Torah you don't revolutionize, but he revealed dimensions of mysticism that his students understood the revolution at the time. For the rest of us, in time, through their students explaining these ideas, actually changed the way we look at the universe, basically on a, on a cosmic level and a microcosmic level. So both the human being is a microcosm of the larger existence. So if you want to understand this connect, you have to understand it both on a cosmic, on a large scale, and on a small scale. You know, physics, especially in astrophysics, a lot of discussion about the Big Bang, about how life evolved. And the discussion is that for something to create life, you need to have some type of, um, some type of radical shifts. Because nothing changes shape unless something happens to it. Like if you were just to um, take a cell, it may multiply, but for you to cr create some real new form of life, you need some radical shift. You need to like shake it up. That's why to, in order to create, for example, uh, to generate nuclear energy, atomic energy, you need to either through very, quick, very unbelievable speeds or tremendous heat that can elicit, that can split atoms or fuse them, fusion or fission. 
So the same is true, the Kabbalists explain, that for a universe like ours to exist as an independent reality, when God is the one that created it all, there has to be some type of radical quantum leap where the divine force, the divine energy concealed itself. And the, the Arizal calls it the great Simtsum Arish, the Simtsum Agadol, the great concealment, sometimes compared to like a black hole. You know, a black hole, even though no one's ever seen a black hole, Einstein predicted it, then later he rejected his own prediction, then he later he embraced it. And bottom line, it was proven to be correct. A black hole is a star that its gravitational pull is so powerful that it doesn't even let light escape. So how do we know it exists if you don't see light? Because there's no light emerging from it. Because you see its impact on its surrounding bodies. Anything that passes in its orbit is affected. So you know there's something. It's like if you saw a piece of metal like suddenly moving, you know there must be a magnet somewhere, even if you don't see the magnet. The same idea. So on a cosmic level, this black hole was essentially a type of um, uh, inversion of reality. And let me share, let me explain it with an example. Example, with a story, actually. So there's this debate between a chassid and a non-chassid. They were talking between a philosopher, a rational philosopher, and a Hasidic mystic. They were debating the existence of God. And the Hasidic mystic finally was exasperated with the argument. He says, you know what? I envy you, he tells the philosopher, the thinker, the non-chassid. He tells him, because you think about God all day. To be very honest, I think about myself most of the time. Okay, with that they parted ways. The scholar, the philosopher thought that was a great compliment coming from this big rabbi. And he began telling people, you know, I had a debate with a rabbi, with famous Hasidic mystic. And you know what he said about me? That I think about God all the time. And he selfish thinks about himself all the time. Well, years passed. And one day someone enlightened him that actually he was insulted. It wasn't, an insult, it wasn't a compliment, it was an insult. Because the mystic was telling him, you think about yourself all day because you, you think about God all day because you know you exist. That's not a question. You're a reality, and your question, does God exist? So you think, you ponder about that all the time. You don't have to think about yourself, because you're a given. So you ponder, does God exist, does God not exist, how does he exist, etc. Whereas the mystic understood that God is a reality. That's for sure God exists. The question is whether I exist. So he thinks about himself all the time. Am I here, am I not here, is this an illusion? Why am I here, etc., etc. Now this isn't just semantics. It's a very different way of looking at reality. I'll give another example that's taken from the, the, Kabbal the Kabbalists explain. Everything in this world today, we know, is driven by invisible forces. If you said this 100 years ago, 150 years ago, people would think you're crazy or you're some religious fanatic. But today, everything is driven by invisible forces. DNA, microscopic particles, subatomic particles. You know. Today we see how we transcend time and space. Cell phones, just use your mobile. How, how does the communication happen? You don't see the airwaves. You don't see sound waves. But these are forces that connect the universe in ways we never could have imagined. Once upon a time, you wanted to get a message from here to here, meaning, let's say, 100 miles away, you needed to rent a camel or a donkey and send, this, and send a messenger to go bring the message, or a horse in, in other countries. And you never knew. You never got a receipt that it was delivered. Either it was or it wasn't. Today, it's instantaneous. You could sit here, open up a television, an internet, and see exactly what's happening in Australia, which is almost a 20-hour flight from here, thousands of miles away, instantaneously. Nobody even understands exactly how it works. They just know it works. Technicians, technology, technology masters have figured out how to manipulate and make it work. But the real mystery? What exactly is happening? How do you see the exact image of millions of miles away? And I say millions, it's even hundreds of millions. Today we have spaceships that are first reaching Pluto. And their messages continue to come back to Earth. You know how many months later? Four months later, they get a message that was sent four months ago. I mean, just, it's just mind-boggling what, what the technology has shown us. But invisible forces shape the world. Today, we no longer think in terms... <laughs> I think I left my phone on. It's all right. If you don't mind, just... The switch on the side, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry about that. I usually... <laughs> um, wh wh what was I saying? Oh, size today doesn't matter. Someone said to you, what's the most powerful army on earth? 
It will not be based on how many soldiers, how many tanks, how much artillery. It'll be based on, on nuclear power, on uh, powers that forces that you can't even see. It's based all, completely on technology. So today the invisible is a reality in our lives. It doesn't mean we understand it better, but we know it's there. So let's talk about it in personal terms. If you see somebody crying and tears come out of their eyes, nobody's going to say that first you cry, then you feel sad, right? First you feel sad, and then the sadness, for some reason, has a psychosomatic impact on your body. Tears well up in your ear, in tear ducts, and then you cry. A smile on someone's face is a contortion that's a result of a certain feeling that turns into a smile. So everything really works from the inside out. When I look at you, the only way I know what you're feeling is if you express yourself, either through words or through body language. My, when I look at myself, I don't have to look in the mirror to know if I feel good. I know it from within, and then I just choose or don't choose it to express it. So the Kabbalists explain that everything in the universe that we see is surface level, is like a glove to a hand that's an invisible hand that you cannot see. And we only see the glove. That's why it's called klipa, if you ever hear the word klipot. Klipa means husks, like a potato peel, an eggshell, an orange peel. A peel is an important component. It protects the fruit within. But imagine you didn't know there's a fruit inside. You only thought the orange is its outer shell. So the way the mystics and the Hasidic masters put it is that we are, delus we are deluded by, we are deceived by the surface level of existence and we think that's all there is. Then your mind tells you it can't be all there is. There must be something more. Let's take human beings. How would you like if someone said the only thing they say, you look nice physically? But I have a whole personality inside of me. Do you know who I am? You care about me or you only care about my externals? Now we are human beings that worship the externals so we can worship superficial things and completely reject that which is within. Which is why at the end of Eshes Chayel, Friday night when we sing it, say it, we say, Shekra Achem Vehevel Yefi, which means false is uh, grace and, and uh, Hevel, empty, empty is um, beauty. And what's really beautiful is a woman that fears God, that has God-fearing. Everyone misinterprets this verse. They think it means it's dismissing beauty. It's not the case. If it was dismissing beauty, the Torah wouldn't describe Sarah, Rivka, Rochel, and Leah as beautiful people. Yifas Mara, Yifas Teir, they were beautiful, physically beautiful. Their structure was beautiful, their look was beautiful. In the Torah, beauty is considered a divine virtue. Zekeli van veyu. We adorn... You should have a nice mezuzah, a nice Torah scroll, a nice mitzvah should be done in, with beauty. The temple was built in a beautiful way. We don't just say, it doesn't matter, the externals look only on the inside. But we say both. If you only worship the outside, then it's sheker. If you only worship the external beauty and you're not interested at all what's going on beneath the surface, that's false, that's superficial. As a matter of fact, an interesting thing, in Hebrew, the word face when we say the face of something in English, on the face of, on face value, we mean surface and not what's underneath the surface. Face is always superficial and shallow. The face of something, you say the face of the object, on the face of it. In Hebrew, when you say ponim, which means face, also means penim, penimiut. The face, the outer and the inner are one seamless flow. So Judaism teaches, the Torah teaches, is that the universe is like a body and a soul. What you see in the outer level is the, is the shell, is the outer layer. Within it is beating a type of pulsating energy. Now, as I said, if I said this 200 years ago, people would think this is a religious guy, some, you know, based on some crazy faith. Today, this is language of physics. There's no such thing as an inanimate object. If we all left this room, would anyone call this a uh, room empty of life? Absolutely not. Light, everything in existence from inanimate minerals and of course the human beings is pulsating with energy. The fact that you don't see it doesn't mean you know how much energy there is in one follicle of hair in this table. These are the subatomic particles, the atoms that are constantly moving and when you know how to tap, tap, tap into it you can create tremendous energy. So there's a surface of things and there's beneath the surface. In terms of science you would call it on the surface you see a, let's say a wooden table probably not wood, some plastic table, but let's say it's wood. Wood is made of elements. Let's say water is made of the elements called H2O, hydrogen to oxygen. 
and um, wood is made of other elements. Elements are made of what? Of molecules. Molecules are made of atoms. Atoms are made of subatomic particles. And today we also know they're sub-subatomic. And every physicist will tell you there's probably thousands of layers. No one knows how deep down the rabbit hole it goes. So what is existence? What you see with your eye is barely the surface, the tip of the iceberg. It's understanding the forces that shape something. Just like I said before, the tears are just an expression of the feelings within. So the Kabbalists developed and understand the entire universe this way. You see it rain outside, so most of us will take an umbrella, a raincoat. The meteorologist will explain to you how the weather patterns are based on pressure systems, on clouds, on different forces, the oceans, low, low, low pressure, high pressure systems. A Kabbalist will tell you that the, that the rain perhaps is divine tears of the angels that are in a way cleansing the universe. Like it says, tears are like the bath, a bath for the soul. They soothe the soul. So you see how many layers you can have in something. That's why when he said that, philosopher said, he said, you think about yourself all day because, yeah, he knows that there's something going on beneath the surface. The question is what's going on on the surface. How real is that? But we look at it the other way. We worship sur the surface of existence. Look how easily we're seduced, how easily we're distracted by external things. Give someone a few dollars and suddenly they can change their whole opinion. You can buy people. Because the world is a very superficial world. However, beneath the superficiality lies layers and layers of truth. And what Arizal came to teach was that there's a deep concealment and a disconnect. Now you may say, what does this have to do with hatred? It has everything to do with hatred. When a person is connected through and through, there can be no hatred because they can't be disconnected. When there's no disconnect, there's no such thing as hatred. The natural expression of connection is love. The natural expression of disconnect is hate, dis discord, discontent, separation. What happens when someone doesn't like another person? They separate from them. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to look at them. I don't want to see them. I hope nobody of you has this sensation, but there's some people you never want to meet. And when you go to a party, you're terrified. Am I going to bump into the person I don't want to meet? You know? Thank God, I could say in my life, I made sure that I don't have any such situation. I can go anywhere and I feel completely comfortable. I mean, maybe some people are not comfortable with me, but that's their problem. You know? But I, I, and I say this to all of you, when you have that type of inner peace and there's a seamless flow of your outer and your inner, there is, you, you have love inside of you. This doesn't mean you're naive. Obviously, there are people that can be very disturbing and there are people that can do things that are very bothersome, which I'll soon discuss. But it means that hatred is not a part of a toxic force that controls your life because disconnection is not what dominates your life. It's connection. And connection begins understanding that you are not just what you think you are. There's a whole layers of forces beneath the surface that shape who you are. And those layers are your soul. So if your body is the surface level, level that you can look in the mirror, that you can experience with your five senses. You know, we see each other's bodies. We hear each other's voices. We can smell each other's scents. We can taste and touch the material world. But then there's a whole other dimension, the supersensory. The supersensory is once you connect. Love can be seen. Hatred also can be seen. But its effect can be seen. This, the one effect of one connects and the effect of other disconnects. So even if you won't call, I don't necessarily say I hate that person, but I just don't want to see them, that's a form of disconnect. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have preferences and not everybody has to be your best friend and there are people who get along and you just relate to more than others. But it also does not mean there's no, there's no negative energy coming outside of you. Now, most of us can feel negative energy. You come to a party, you attend a, an event, you meet people, you pretty much can pretty quickly pick up someone giving off negative energy. You know, how they look at you, their attitude, their cynicism, and so on. And we could also tell positive energy. I noticed it just today, I was looking at my little grandson, and I saw we were you know, in a store, and there were two people there. One person was a very kind, giving person, even though he wasn't acting in a necessarily kind, giving person, but he gave off that energy. And I saw my grandson, my little child, my little boy, like gravitating, speaking to him, smiling. Another person you could see on the face was ungestrengt, uh, as they say, you know, very, uh, um, what's it called, strained, very anxious, a lot of negative energy. And I saw that my grandson literally just walked away. Now, how did he sense it? It's not because of brilliance. Because energy is energy. And when you're sensitive, especially a child, a child senses it. 
Unfortunately, a child also is not always can see someone. There are con artists and people who know, know how to manipulate. But the point I'm making is that connection is when you're connected with yourself. You're connected with the forces that shape who you are. His expression, Ezu chachem hareyes anelet. Who's the wise person? The one who sees the birthing. It means the one who's able to see not the immediate picture, but the big picture. That's a connector. People who live in the moment are completely consumed with the moment. Someone says something to you and insults you, your whole day is destroyed. People who see the bigger picture can be rattled that quickly because they have a solid foundation. They look at things in context. This does, again, this doesn't mean that we accept everything. I'll soon address that, as I said. But the first thing I wanted to establish was that the word hatred is really a root result from disconnection. A disconnection. So then, of course, back to the question earlier, I said Sinai brought hatred to this world. What does that mean? A type of hatred. So here, this brings us to the real meaning of what that means. There's hatred and there's hatred. I wouldn't even use the word hatred in that context. When a person, for example, sees an injustice done to another person, some of us just walk, walk on and ignore it. Some people, um, unfortunately, participate in, in, in torturing the other person. And then the lesser amount of people who actually will do something about it and will be disturbed by it. You know, today they have all these videos and how people just walk by when someone's mugged they don't want to get involved, or they just don't, they're afraid for their own skin, and so on. So when you, dis, when you are repulsed by, by injustice, by something wrong, you see a child, an innocent child being hurt, and you don't have any repulsive attitude, you don't have any negative attitude, there's something wrong. Not because you're disconnected, because you're connected. So this goes back to what I said earlier, love, a component of love is also to despise anything that undermines that love. So when you see, let's say, healthy people living in a community, and then suddenly a force comes in and disrupts them, and brings machlekas, brings battle and discord and hatred, gossip, slander, that breaks apart friends. You know, there are people who do that. They tell people things about the other, true or not true, and they break, they break a friendship. That, we should not be neutral to that, because our love for connection the connection we have to existence, to each other, to the whole universe, should also cause us to be disturbed. To the point of, you know, again, the word hatred, I wouldn't use the word hatred because hatred is usually alludes to a negative, but this tachlis sina sinasim, King David said. He hated the wicked. He uses the word sina. But this context of hatred is a positive one. It means you're hating everything that's opposite of connection and love. Not hatred is a disconnector, but a hatred is everything that disconnects. There was a, there was a, there was a Rebbe, one of the Rebbe's, a Siddiq Rebbe, had only one son, a Ben Yochid. You know, obviously, a person loves all their children, but when you have one child, it's even more precious in a way. And somebody was very resentful of the Rebbe's relationship with his son. He wanted a so-called, um, um, uh, what's the word, find favor in the father's eyes. So he went and told the father, that his son behaved in a, in a very in an inappropriate way. And for those few days that the father believed it, the father had a certain type of like, distance, a disconnect from his own son. But he did what he did was, he sent one of his aides, one of his secretaries, one of his assistants to go find out if it's true, to follow his son, to see if he indeed is going to the library. You know, he was telling him that he was reading the wrong books. He was exposing himself to things that are inappropriate, inappropriate relatively speaking. And they, and, they, and, they, and they followed the son, and they found that the whole thing was not true. It was complete check, complete false. The story goes that the, this Rebbe, who was an extremely mild-mannered person, would never behave in any, went to this fellow and literally pushed him out of his, 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 his shul, which was completely uncharacteristic. He said that you could have come and create such a split, even for, for a day or two, between me and my son, I'm based, I'm based on nothing. This was like... So had he been just mild-mannered and say, you know what, okay, I understand, he was jealous, whatever. No. Someone who really loves something also hates the opposite of that love. But not hatred that comes from an uncontrollable or uh, selfish place. On the contrary. When King David said he hated that which was antithetical to the divine, to God, 
It was not hatred that you see. Like, you know, you could ask the question, one second, what, we look at ISIS, these other radical Muslims who behead people, burn them alive, you know, images that repulse us all. So I'm not going to defend them, but let's for argument's sake, I'll just play devil's advocate. I hope it's not offensive what I'm going to say. So that's what I'm going to say. They convinced that their path is God's path. And this person they're burning alive or beheading is a, the devil. Okay, you, they may be wrong. But let's say there is a person who completely feels this is what God wants me to do. How do we know? How do we know it's not coming from a godly place? How do we know that it's... And, they, and if you spoke to them, I guarantee you they'll tell you this is what God wants. You know? So you know how you know a few things. First of all, you have to look at the glee and the happiness that a person is doing that. In Judaism, when the Egyptians were drowning in the Red Sea, the Red Sea, and the angels began to sing shira, they began to praise God. Now we're talking about Egyptians, Nazis. They were like Nazis. They persecuted the Jews, they killed Jews. 210 years, not just 15 years, like Hitler. And not only that, the Jews, they already released them, and they still couldn't stand it, and they pursued them. Can you imagine that, that, the, the, the Azari is the sadism of that? Let them go already. The 210 years, they were slave laborers. You killed so many of their children. You bathed in their blood. They already left. No, we're pursuing them. So you would think, finally, thank God, the wicked are finally suffering. Usually, we, like Job says, that the wicked prosper and the good suffer. Here you finally have the wicked suffering. Everyone should be dancing and celebrating. The Mishnah says, when your enemies fall, do not celebrate. And when the angels began to sing praise, Shira, God said, my creatures are sinking, are, are drowning in the water and you're singing praise. What does that mean? One second, why shouldn't they sing praise? They're wicked people. Because they should be crying that human beings who were creating the divine image could fall so low that their only choice was to kill them. Don't celebrate. You should be crying. So that's the first sign. If you see someone is laughing and dancing on someone else's grave, even if, and, not, and don't get me, get me wrong, I don't think ISIS is representing God in any way, you see there's something wrong. It's not divine. Because it's coming with a, with a glee. It's coming with a uh, passion. People like that should be avoiding. You know what it says in the Talmud about capital punishment is acceptable in the Torah. But it rarely happened. Capital punishment. An interesting thing, the Talmud says that a court that put someone to death once in 70 years, you know what they call that court? A murderous court, katlonis. A murderous court. Why would you call the court? No one's, no one's saying that they were corrupt. No one's saying they put someone to death who was innocent. No, because they should have found some merit. Judges are, are there to help save the world, not destroy it. If there's no other choice than with great tears in your eyes, and you're the last one that lines up, you want to avoid it by all means, there's no choice. But never is it with joy. It's you cry that there's someone on earth that unfortunately there was no way around it because they were so destructive. But you never see that as a celebration. In other words, it's not about you. Hatred, the negative form, is about you. You're hating someone. I want that person destroyed. When, when King David or other expressions like the Sinai says that hatred descended, it was not hatred personal. It was hating everything that's antithetical to love. When you see people are trying to disrupt and destroy a world that is loving each other, communities, families, and so on, yes, you, you're repulsed by it. That's the word I would use, repulsed, revolted, all the other synonyms you can find for this. That's a very different type of hatred because it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with God and the cause. As soon as your feelings get involved, it's, it's, it's a problem. So real love is not selfish love. It's about selfless love. It's about transcendence. And real hatred, the, the positive type, is also about transcendence. It's simply about, about being zealous to get rid of the infection. When white blood cells attack an infection inside the body, they do it pretty ruthlessly. But that's exactly the way it's meant to be because they're protecting a healthy body from an invader, from a foreign alien force. You won't, you're not going to say the, the, the white blood cells are suddenly, you know, like ISIS, 
the killers and terrorists and, and um, radicals. That's part of health is to get rid of anything that is the opposite of health. When you see a parent protect his child from a predator, from a murderer, and does it passionately, that's the sign of someone as a healthy human being. It's not a selfish thing. It's, it's, it's maintaining the balance. So health, so love and hatred in that sense, love is connect, hatred is disconnect. And then the positive connect sometimes requires to fight the enemies in this world. You have to do so with an equal amount of passion, but it's not about you. And it's not about your emotions. It's never about your emotions. As a matter of fact, if a person feels that they have, to, that they, they have some type of pleasure in sitting in judgment of another person, they should, they should recuse themselves. Because it's not about you. You should never be part of, in any way, a negative reaction to another person. Which is why we, parents, for example, a healthy parent, when so their child does something wrong, there's ways that you can reprimand your child in a healthy way and in an unhealthy way. And I always ask parents when this question, I say, your child comes home from school, they really did something really bad. You know, objectively, everyone agrees there was, the child misbehaved. What's the reaction? You can't ignore it. So there are parents who always blame somebody else. The school, the principal, the other children, the other mother, the other father. You know, they always have someone else to blame. My child can't be blamed, which really means I can't be blamed. Okay, that's one attitude. So they don't do anything. Then you have parents who are the other extreme. As soon as they hear something, they punish the child, they ground the child, they demoralize the child. And now the child is also in pain and suffering because the parent is, so to speak, uh, um, uh, uh, punishing them. Both those approaches are not love. They're both pe people going by their nature. The first parent can't be wrong. My child can't be wrong. It's always someone else's fault. The second parent is just happened to have gvuras in, in their personality. They happen to be severe people. And their severity is now the child, is now the subject of their severity. It's nothing to do with the child doing it. Anyone that does that is because they have that anger inside of them. So right, my child, punishment time. What does a healthy parent do? A healthy parent sits the child down with patience and tries to figure out how do I get across to my child two messages at once. One is that I love you from the depths of my heart and I will not break your spirit and demoralize you and destroy your confidence. On the other hand, I want to get the message that what you did was wrong. How does a loving person do that? So first of all, you sleep on it. You don't just react out of uh, impulsive reaction. Oh, I'm angry and I, I, you embarrassed me or you're embarrassed, uh, you know, I'm going to punish. You think about it. And then you sit down the child and you say to the child, I'm just giving you an example. Uh, you know, any parent can say it in many different ways. I love you from the depths of my heart, unconditionally. I've done everything in my life to help bring you up as a, and actualize your potential that you should be a beautiful child. Your beautiful soul should shine in this world. You, know, you did something yesterday or today that was not right. You hurt another child. You said something wrong. You were disrespectful, whatever it is. And it breaks my heart that you who have such a beautiful soul, are not living up to your great potential. And as a result, I, have to, I want to get the message to you. And you find some way that the child understands it's serious, whether it is some form of depriving them of something, but not done ever with anger. It's done with the same love, except love has two sides to it. Love is love, loving and rewarding and being positive energy when something positive is done. It's also saying that you don't ignore when something's wrong because you love the person, not because you hate them. Because you love the child, because you love the child, you want the child to live up to its greatest, um, its greatest potential, sometimes there have to be consequences for certain behavior. Like another Rebbe who was once, once in his whole lifetime, his son said, once he touched me in my face when I did something, not a slap, he just patted me on the face. And then I saw my father standing in the corner and crying. And that was the lesson. I couldn't stand my father crying. Crying that he had to do that. Now, any parent can get this message across if they think about it. It's the, hard, the third approach is the hardest one, but it's the one that comes from love. So love doesn't always mean that it spells out in a very openly loving way. Sometimes love spells itself out. If you expect something from someone, you care. You know something, if someone you don't care about, so you don't care if they uh, don't live up to their potential, but if you care, you're going to do something about it. And you'll make sure never to demoralize or break the child. Because that's not the goal. The goal is not to break and demoralize the child. The, the goal is to lift them up, to give them uh, confidence, to rise, to make them feel next time that they won't do it because it doesn't pass. It's not appropriate. So in other words, it's all about lifting the spirit and showing how much more you can be. 
Now, obviously this takes effort, takes discipline, but the point I'm making here is it's about connection and disconnection. And this approach that I just mentioned of the parent is still a connection. However, it's a connection that takes a little pain involved. There may be some, a moment of uh, separation in order for there to be a deeper love that comes afterwards. Because that's how the process works. That's really what Shuvah is about. When the Jews build the golden calf, right? Sinai, it was right after Sinai. God said, I am your God. And then right afterwards, as we just read on uh, Sunday, in the Ten Commandments, I am your God that took you out of Egypt. You shall not have false gods. There you have mitzvah sesa, mitzvah sesa. It says in, in the holy books that anoichi is the root of all positive mitzvahs, all 248, and is the root of all shasa, all the 365 negative. So one is the connection, anoichi, and one is the disconnection, lo yilacha. Now why would God care if you build a false god? Who really, is God jealous? Someone wants to be foolish and they're going to bow to a piece of stone or a wood or a tree or a star. So, big thing, they want to be idiots there. So, why is idolatry from Yara Gva Yave? You have to die before you bow to an idol. It's equated with murder, with, with incest. Why would you equate idolatry with such severe crime? And the answer is, it's not because God is jealous, it's because once you create a God on your terms, why do I want to have another God? Because I want a God that I can relate to, someone I can talk to, something I can see. Once you're not submitting to a God that's a creator beyond you, and you're not ready to accept something greater than you are, you want a God, instead of you being created in the divine image, you're creating a God in your image, you undermine the whole purpose, the whole point of all of life. Because then yourself, then you're worshiping yourself. It's essentially idolatry is like self-worship. It's a God on my terms. I don't want a God on God's terms, I want a God on my terms. Then the whole, uh, the whole Torah falls apart, if that's the case. Because then, if on my terms, then whatever's convenient for you, that's what you do. The foundation of it all is that there is something greater than you that puts you here. And you submit, submit your life to it. It's telling you what to do. You don't tell it what to do. So the connection to God, Anoichi, is a connection. Le'ilacha is a disconnection. Now, when the Jews built the golden calf 39 days later, the wrath of the divine came down upon them. You're the sinner. Before Sinai, it may not have been a great a crime. Idolatry was not acceptable. But they didn't hear the yilacha. Here they heard from God's mouth, from, they heard from God's mouth, they heard you shall not have a false god. This foundation, cardinal sin. So now, Sinai brought two things into the world. It brought love and connection to what is true. And now, a discon and, and a despi despising everything that's not true. You know, in an ambiguous world, where tevira, good and evil, can be like snowball together, you know, it's called the taruvas tevira, which you don't know what's right, what's wrong, and so on. Sinai delineated in a very clear way, clarity. This is right and this is wrong. This is divine and this is antithetical to divine. This is love and this is the opposite of love. And when you do this, you're, you're connected. When you do this, you get disconnected. So Sinai introduced the idea that Sinai brought sinna, to everything, to to anything that was like idol worship, anything antithetical to God was like the parent who says, I love my child so much, I don't want that child to be doing things that are inappropriate. Because we live in a world where there are all kinds of distractions. So it, what comes together with this love is the dislove, the unlove, or the, you could say the lack of love, or the hatred to everything that's opposite of love. Hatred, again, the, the desp despising of, being repulsed by anything that's the opposite of connection. And the same is through the rest of the Ten Commandments. You have the positives and you have the negatives. The negatives are all about not introducing something that's negative. It's introducing that you have to avoid certain things in this world if you want to be connected. You cannot steal. You cannot murder. You cannot covet. You cannot um, be, be sexual promiscuous, etc., etc. There are boundaries. There are things that create health in this world and things that create non health. A good doctor is passionate about healing, but is also very passionate of fighting illness. If he was like complacent to fighting illness, it would not be healthy. It's not just about loving health, it's also about disloving or not liking, disliking lack of health. But, but disliking it for the right reasons because it's part of the process of creating that type of uh, fusion of heaven and earth, which was the staple of Sinai. 
So, in practical terms, in practical terms, you know, imagine what this world would be like if we had no hate in our hearts. There was no hate in the world. That's a world of messianic world. As the Rambam says, Maimonides, the end of Hilchus Malachim, end of his Mishnah Torah, that it'll be a world like Le Yakina Vale Sakhrus, Le Mahoma Le Ravale Mahoma, there'll be no longer jealousy, envy, and sakhrus is a type of hatred, unhealthy competition, greed. And there won't be rav, there won't be hunger, and there won't be uh, mohamma, war. But basically eliminating the discord that exists between people. There'll be differences between us. Diversity is fine. We're talking about divisiveness. So you know that when the creation of the world, it was the first three days, the first day, Yom Echad, God created light. The second day, God created separation between the lower heaven and the higher heavens. And the third day was Yom Shlishi, the third day, Shohuch Bobaikitayv. So it says on the second day is the only day that it does not say it was good. Why? Because when there's separation, it potentially can lead to divisiveness. And on day three, Shalom was created, Teferis, the third path that creates harmony within diversity. So diversity is a healthy thing that we should be diverse. But how does diversity work well is when each component recognizes the value of the other, like I said before, with the human body or nature in general. Trillions of cells hundreds, thousands of different systems at work. And yet they're all symbiotic. They all give and take in a healthy way. A lack of health is when there's disconnect, when the, divi- then the, 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 the diversity becomes divisive. You know, when there's, let's say, autoimmune disease, when the body turns on itself, or other types of diseases that begin to, begin to cr- destroy. Now the verse in Isaiah, it says, as, the, as Maimonides brings at the end of his book, it says, There will no longer do evil and no destruction on my holy mountain. Key, why? Because the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. So the question is asked, what does knowledge have to do with destruction? There are many people who are very knowledgeable and they, did do, did, they, they fought wars and they were very destructive. The Nazis and the Germans were not uh, idiots. There were scientists among them and scholars and philosophers, and they created the most unprecedented destruction in the universe. They weren't just some type of primitive, ignorant nation. They were very literate. They were too literate, maybe, for their own good. So what does it mean, Mola Deus Hashem, because there's Deus Hashem? The answer is Deus Hashem, not just knowledge, divine knowledge. And it's interesting, when you think about Chet Eitz which is the eating from the tree of knowledge, also das. It doesn't say Eitz HaChochma, the, the tree of wisdom, Eitz Abina, the tree of understanding. It says the tree of das. Because the word for das, das means hiskashrus, connection, like love. Chochma is the spark of an idea. Bina is the elaboration. Das is when you bond and it becomes one with you. That's why das is the word in Hebrew for intimacy, for sexuality. For Adam Yoda as Chava. It says, Adam knew Eve. Knowing is an expression in Torah for intimacy. Because knowing is not just you are aware of that or something. You connect to it. And intimacy is two entities becoming one flesh. Spiritually, it means that when you connect with Das, you have an intimacy with the knowledge. It's not just you know the idea. When they ate from the tree of knowledge, they knew of good and evil beforehand. But not in Das. They didn't experience it. Theoretically, of course, Adam and Chava knew because the mere fact that God told them to not eat from the tree, that right away tells them that what you should do, what you shouldn't do. But that's still theoretical. That's like teaching a child, these are right things, wrong things. But once you eat from it, then they lose their innocence. Then there's no turning back. Now you can't just say it's theoretical anymore. Once they taste from it, now they bonded. Eitz Adas, it became an intimate connection. And that's the beginning of the disconnect of existence. Before that, Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. Why not? Because since when is nudity anything to be ashamed of? Just like God created your eyes and your ears and your head and your body, sexuality is part of a divine plan. Why should it be something that's embarrassing? And then suddenly you see they ate from the tree of knowledge. They're ashamed. They had to cover themselves. Which was a healthy reaction to cover. But why shame? Newborn children are not ashamed of their sexuality. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a divine entity. It's when you know that you're a self and you have a conscious self and you you sense your, your, your desires and you send your lusts and you sense I'm an entity. You don't see yourself as part of a divine 
reality, then your sexuality, you become very self-conscious about it because there's a self to be conscious about. When God says, comes to the Garden of Eden, he says, Ayeka, where are you, Adam? So of course, the obvious question, what do you mean, where are you? God didn't know where he was? So the Alter Rebbe answered this minister, the famous answer. When he asked him the question, he so, so he gave him the Rashi's answer. And the minister, a non-Jewish minister, said to the Alter Rebbe, the, Rebbe, the Balatanya, Rabbi Shnei Zalman, I know Rashi's answer, I want your answer. So the Alter Rebbe was a tall man, he stood up, he looked the minister in his eyes, he said, Ayeka is the question that God asks every human being. You're 72 years old. Where are you? I don't recognize you. I, I created you in the divine image. You've wandered away from yourself. Sometimes you're sitting near somebody, and you say, where are you? You know where they are. Their body is there, but they spaced out. They're not with you anymore. He was telling Adam, I don't see you. I don't recognize you. Where, where did you go away? You were once my partner. We were partners in creation. You were created in my image. Where are you? Where's your spirit? Where's your mind? Where's your heart? And the minister, who happened to be 72 years old, fainted because he said it with such piercing words. He says, what have you done with your life? You're 72 years old. Where are you? He asked for the answer, so he got his answer. And that's the story. The story is the connection and disconnection that we are with ourselves. Are we living up to who we really are? Have we betrayed ourselves? It's far deeper to betray yourself than to betray others. Betray your own destiny, your own calling, distracted by whatever life brought you in this world. So chetet tzadas, and then comes the tikkun of it, is mola aras deyes Hashem. There's also mola aras chamas. That was the mabel, the flood that came as a result of a corrupt world that resulted, that came after the generation after the tree of knowledge. And then the tikkun is a world filled with divine knowledge. What? As the waters cover the sea. Waters completely submerge. So you don't even feel yourself as an independent entity. Like fish in the sea are not an independent entity. They're part of water. There's even an opinion of Shreem ben Gamliel that fish are like water itself. That if a fish touches you when you go to the mikveh, it's not like chitzah, it's not like chitzah, because fish are like water. It's not like a, uh, some, something in between. Allah is not like that, but nevertheless, fish, water that covers the sea is that you, you have become the divine knowledge. And when you become divine knowledge and connect, it's impossible for you to do some type of damage or destruction or hatred or anything. It's natural there will be no war. It's not a miracle. It's because when people are consumed with divine knowledge and they know the purpose of their lives, then there's natural respect for everyone around them, diversity, the harmony within diversity, which is the staple and the, and the power that, that happened at Sinai for that moment. Right before they came to Sinai, when they arrived at Sinai, rather, they were all, even as much discord that there was, they all joined like one person, one heart. And then after Sinai, after the honeymoon, so to speak, the discord began, but then at the end of times, the final repair will be when it will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. Now, I hope I did justice to this topic. It's a very big topic, as you can see. But to sum up in practical terms for each of us, we're all disconnected in many ways, let's be honest. When we were newborn children, we were connected. Life disconnects us. We get disconnected from our own soul. We get this from our calling from our own beings. And the world indoctrinates us to worship materialism, to worship money, to worship power. All those forces is really betraying yourself. And as I said earlier with beauty, money, material world is not a curse, but it's a curse if it gets disconnected from its fruit within. It's a glove that's meant to protect the hand. If, love, if money, materialism, ego, vanity, becomes a force of its own and loses its soul, then we lose our soul. So the whole purpose of Sinai was to connect. And any type of losing your soul is a disconnect that leads either to hatred or to the other vices. It could be envy, it could be uh, anger, and so on. And the way to look at it is to find ways to reconnect. Reconnect simply means you have to make time every day for your soul. In the morning you say, I acknowledge my soul is returned to me. You have to never forget that it's your soul that you are here to express. Everything else are tool, is a tool chest. Your job is a tool chest. Where you travel, where you go, those are tools. Your purpose in life is to actualize your neshama, to connect to others. That when you go to work, you go to a doctor, you go to commute, 
Your job is to connect, to, do, to, to redeem sparks, to connect things, to show to see the divine providence in your life, to bring a nice, kind word to another person, instead of disconnections. Look, life is so filled with disconnections. You know, we're all in business. The whole business is a negotiation. I'm not you, you're not me, so we negotiate. Hopefully it's done ethically, but still there's a disconnect. I don't tell you what cards I have in my hand if I want to negotiate. Well, it's all about um, a battle of, uh, like a, a rat race. And then there's introducing, even into our work, a certain civility of recognizing these are the tools, the means. The end is that we are all really all creatures. We are all divine forces in this world. Each of us here to fulfill a particular calling. We all need each other. We're all like music, indispensable musical notes in a large composition. Everyone necessary and everyone needing the other. And when a person has that connection within themselves, to themselves, it's easier to connect to others. So you don't have to look for, to someone else for things you may not have. You can then say, I know what I am, so now I can coexist with someone else. As soon as you begin to think in terms of, oh, I may be, uh, you know, if I have this amount of money, that's what makes me powerful or gives me status, immediately you're creating the disconnection that is so uh, a cardinal element in our society where we are ultimately separate entities, the selfish gene, trying to get and, 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 uh, and, uh, as much as we can and give the least. Whereas in turn, you're really thinking in terms of giving the most and taking the least. So God should bless us all that we should take the energy of Matan Torah, of Shavuos, into, the, into our lives. The Sinai experience, which teaches us both connection and teaches us how to abhor and be repelled by disconnect. And also try to eliminate from ourselves any tinges of hatred and so on. And the way you do that is bringing love into your life. Expressing love. Finding ways to give. So, until next week, everybody should have a very pleasant week. Next Wednesday we continue this journey. Uh, tomorrow night, Philip gives his, I believe, Thursday night class. You can check with us in the office if you need. And there's other, any other spiritual needs or psychological, emotional uh, we're here for you in any possible way, the Meaningful Life Center. Thank you very much. I always have my fan club that... Uh